This episode is brought to you by Direct TV Stream. Direct TV Stream brings you the live TV you love. That means you can stay up to the minute on 24-hour live news, from entertainment to current events, wherever you are in the U.S., whether that's at home, on your TV, or streaming on the go. And you get your favorite live sports, so you can catch this season's biggest games. Get the best of live TV with Direct TV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. My name is Dr. Miranda Melcher. I'm one of the hosts. And I'm really excited today to be talking to Dr. Adam Hanna about his book titled Poetry, Politics and the Law in Modern Ireland, published by Syracuse University Press in 2022. Um, I'm particularly indebted to the press in this particular case because they sent me an advanced review copy, which was quite thrilling, to be honest, to receive. Um, But I'm even more excited to be speaking to Adam about his book that explores how modern Irish poetry has been shaped by and has responded to the laws, judgments and constitutions of both of the countries, obviously, in the island of Ireland. Um, And this is really interesting because he looks at some poets that um, probably a lot of us are going to be familiar with, as well as some that maybe are less well known, um, and brings it directly into dialogue with a bunch of really contentious legal and sociocultural issues as well. So um, as I mentioned to him briefly before we started the recording for this, um, as a reader, I found this book really interesting because it brought together two things that I kind of already had an awareness of, uh, poetry in Ireland being such a big part of it, part of the culture, um, and politics and law obviously being quite complicated in modern Ireland, um, and yet had somehow never thought about those two things together. Adam, however, has, and he's written a book about it. So I'm really excited to welcome you, Adam, to the podcast. Great. Well, thank you so much, Miranda. I'm just, as I was uh, saying to you before we got going, just delighted that anyone has read my book and I'm honoured that you take the time to do so. So thank you very much for that. Could we start off, please, with you introducing yourself a bit and explaining why you decided to write the book? Sure. Uh, Well, I'm a lecturer in Irish literature at University College Cork. Um, I uh, focus on modern Irish poetry in particular. Uh, and how I decided to write this book, uh, when, you, when I read that question, when you sent them to me beforehand, I just kept on going back and back. I don't know where you can uh, say a starting point for any PhD project is. I think in my case, it began with just an interest in Irish poetry. So as a teenager, I just picked up a book, uh, Collected Yates, and was entranced by it. Uh, And I think it really all flows from there. There is such a sense of drama and imagination and the lyrical sound, the rhythm of the poems. This was clearly masterful poetry, and I just wanted to know more about it and where it came from. And so I had the chance uh, to explore this poetry further. First of all, just by chatting to my teachers, looking back, I now see what a privilege it was and how lucky I was to have teachers who went above and beyond what was needed, uh, you know, who would chat to me outside class time, who would sometimes lend me books, who were excited about the literature that I was excited about. Uh, I think it's it's a tremendous uh, blessing and uh, I I do think I was uh, tremendously lucky to have that. And so I knew I wanted to pursue this at university. Now I went to York University And uh, I uh, got to study with a guy called Professor Hugh Horton, who's a great hero of mine. Uh, He, um, I uh, I studied pretty much uh, most of the poets that I've written about in this book. I first, I think, came across in in Hugh Horton's classes and um, got to the end of my degree. Now, I have to say there was no funding and no encouragement really uh, for any further study. Uh, but there was if I pursued law. So I've, I've qualified as a, as a lawyer, um, not without any particular enthusiasm, but um, it did give me the chance to uh, dwell on what I did want to do and also to save up a bit of money to do a master's, which I ended up doing after a few years in law. Uh, so I suppose I had this legal background and then I went into the doctorate on Irish poetry. Now, you fast forward from there and I put together a postdoctoral project idea on law and poetry. And I wanted to pursue this with an academic called Heather Laird at Cork. And she's another one of these sort of academic idols. What she's very interested in, and her 2005 book, Subversive Law, is a great touchstone for this, is how on the island of Ireland, 
we have to consider uh, law as being a kind of multivalent concept, not as something perhaps that comes from uh, the sort of locus of political power of laws handed down and then um, <clears throat> from a sort of high high point uh, down. Sorry. <clears throat> The law isn't a uh, something that comes from a central point and is handed down, but is in fact created by the actions of the communities uh, who are theoretically subject to uh, these sort of centralizing laws. And so you see uh, folk legal practices, uh, alternative legal practices, and as her, verse, as her book is called, subversive laws, even subversive legal practices, which are rooted in communities and yet have nothing to do and are often... Uh, often counteract uh, official law-giving sources. Of course, in a colonial context like Ireland's, that historically, that is going to be much more likely because essentially what is seen as central law and power is seen as the kind of um, legitimation or the attempted legitimation of forces that stand for, um, I suppose, exploitation. Uh, And so... Uh, in maybe a non-colonial context, you aren't going to have the same complications involving law. So I was just fascinated, I suppose, by the different sources of law, the way that the Irish colonial context impacted on these, the different ways of seeing law. So anyway, I applied to do this postdoctoral project with Heather. Uh, That got funded, and I had a really great couple of years um, just at University College Cork. Um, uh, pursuing this project, writing the majority of this book. I had two years and I could go to the National Library every day. I could just immerse myself in this project. And it was tremendously lucky. Uh, I, um, uh, it, it, it's really, it made the book that you read possible. So after those two years in the National Library, I was uh, offered a lectureship at University College Cork. I'm still there. Uh, and yeah, uh, it's so... I, I think uh, it's funny that my background has involved li- literary studies and legal studies, and this kind of ties those two elements together. It does tie them together. Um, in fact, it makes a lot of sense that you have that background um, and kind of what you've been able to come up with in the book, um, especially with the ability to go look at all the wonderful things and immerse yourself in them. That sounds like a really amazing kind of research process um and towards the end of the interview i'll probably ask you a little bit about the research process um but in the meantime i'd love to kind of i guess do a bit of a highlights tour of some of the aspects of the book and um, we're obviously not going to be able to get into uh, every detail but maybe we can cover some of the highlights um so i'd love to start kind of at the beginning of the book uh you open with perhaps the most famous poet or one of them um yates And I, again, had vaguely remembered from something that in addition to being obviously a poet, he was a politician, um, in fact, a a senator. Um, And again, had never tied those two things together, which I think speaks more to my own gaps in knowledge. Um, But I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about from this knowledge um, and from your kind of deep dive into both his political career and his poetry, you talk about in the book, quote, intriguing consonances, because it turns out as he was kind of making these big political speeches, he was writing his poetry at the same time. This this was very much an overlapping time period. So can you kind of tell us about the impact that those two things sort of had on each other? Sure. Um, I Yeah, these consonances, um, I think, are there. If you read the Senate speeches alongside the more imaginative output from those same years. So I guess the two most famous things that he wrote in during his period as a senator, he wrote most of his great modernist masterwork, The Tower, which is probably his most celebrated single volume. He published that in 1928. Most of those poems were written during his tenure as a senator. He also wrote this very odd and intriguing, uh, this esoteric philosophical work called Vision. So it's a prose work uh, that Public, the first version was published in 1925. So again, the majority of its writing overlapped with his tenure as a senator. And so what I did, I guess, was try to read these three things in parallel, because it's a great case study in how not only, um, of course, are there shared uh, preoccupations between these three, but actually how they diverge. And therefore, how do laws and legislation diverge from the world of the imagination. I think that you can ask some very big questions relating to law and literature. 
just by looking at this single and singular case study of Yeats in the Senate. Now, you ask me about what some of these consonances are. And so I think there's several layers to this. Um, The Senate speeches show, I think, Yeats both at his most practical and uh, at his most willing to roll up his sleeves and look at real societal problems, think how they might be resolved, but also at his most irascible at times as well. He comes across uh, as, uh, as a less than helpful contributor in public discourse. Of course, his most famous speech in the Senate um, he famously said that the Anglo-Irish caste with which he came, claimed kinship were no petty people. And this um, was, you know, I think denounced as uh, perhaps essentializing sectarian even at the time. And it's come to define his time in the Senate. But if you look at the full range of speeches and writings from this period, they tell uh, they, they, they just show a more complicated picture. And so that's, I suppose, what I wanted to do. So, OK, so looking at the first layer of how his Senate speeches and his um, and his role as a legislator and his poetry overlap. You might look, for example, at this um, famous speech where he condemned the Irish government attempting to ban divorce. The Irish government did, in effect, ban divorce in the 1920s, and then this was codified in the 1930s. And Yeats saw this as an attack on uh, civil liberties, essentially. And so, as I say, this is where he uh, claimed that the Anglo-Irish caste were no petty people and so on. And so you can look at specific lines from this speech in condemnation of uh, the attempted ban on divorce. And you can actually just follow that across to certain, you know, them across to certain uh, poems. Uh, He points out, for example, that the uh, Catholic piety of the Irish free state, I guess, on which it based these laws trying to ban divorce. He he thought of this as... um, uh, as, as a kind of uh, sham, as self-deception, as uh, involving a lot of looking away from or ignoring facts and realities of Irish life. And so one of the things he says in his speech is that some of the great national heroes whose statues are in the middle of the city are were in fact themselves not paragons of sexual purity, and yet they were still celebrated. And so was it not the case that the Irish state, in fact, was championing uh, you know, I suppose, values and mores, which, you know, were entirely at odds with some of the great national heroes. Who's thinking there of Daniel O'Connell, perhaps, uh, whose, um, uh, whose statue stood at the end of the street that, uh, that bears his name. So then you see in a, po- in a, uh, in a um, uh, poem, uh, sorry, in, in the tower, you see a poem like the three monuments where he talks about uh, Daniel O'Connell and says uh, and and the statues around him and he ends it saying these three old rascals laugh out loud but you can see when they hear the sort of rhetoric of purity that built the state and after kept it from decay and so on, the kinds of things that Yeats was hearing in the Senate and bridling against then make its way into into the poetry so there's there's that kind of surface level I guess you can can see the other famous example being uh, the poem Among School Children. He was on a committee uh, to inquire into the state of primary education. And out of that came uh, a school's act in the mid-1920s, but also one of his most celebrated poems of the 1920s, um, Among School Children, where he writes about uh, visiting a classroom and how the children's eyes, uh, you know, the children uh, momentarily stare uh, at the smiling 60-year-old public man who, um, who passes them by. So, as I say, his senatorial work was uh, is, is there on the surface. It's also there, I think, in other ways, maybe ways that are less easy to spot. So, for example, Yeats was committed to the propagation and the restoration, I guess, of the historic cultural glories of Ireland. Uh, you know, just from the beginning of his career, I guess he saw his project as one of revival and resurrection. And so he was, uh, one of the things that most frightened him, I guess, in the early 1920s was the threat to the material heritage of the country that war brought. Of course, war doesn't just destroy human lives. It destroys the physical artifacts of the past as well. The National Museum of Ireland, during the period of civil war, was connected to the place where the senators met. 
And this struck Yeats as a terrible idea, because, of course, there was a real incentive for enemies of the Irish state, that is, the uh, Republicans who are currently waging war against the government in Dublin, uh, to burn down the Senate and hence burn down uh, the National Museum. And so he gives some amazing speeches in the 1920s where he literally goes around the Senate checking on their fire precautions and he comes back and says, I was told there were sand buckets, there are no sand buckets. I was told that there was a fireproof door, there's no fireproof door. There's one speech where he mentions the words fireproof door five times in the same paragraph. He's saying, you know, this is, you know, our, our, the, the protections we've taken are inadequate. We are going to risk the material glories of uh, of the Irish past being melted down if we carry on uh, if we carry on in this way now you take this preoccupation and then when you read a volume like the tower you can see how this is lifted into the realm of I guess um, I guess philosophical abstraction I'll just read you a few lines from the tower and maybe you can see the same preoccupations that struck him in the civil war at, at work in his poetry this is from one of his poems in the tower Everything that man esteems endures a moment or a day. Love's pleasure drives his love away. The painter's brush consumes his dreams. The herald's cry, the soldier's tread, exhaust his glory and his might. Whatever flames upon the night, man's own resinous heart has fed. Now there's a difference in approach between Yeats the legislator and Yeats the imaginative poet, whereas Yeats the legislator is entirely preoccupied with preservation and with fear. Yeats the poet actually understands existence as coming in cycles of destruction and creation. Whatever flames upon the night, man's own resinous heart has fed. That there's a kind of cycle of the gathering of energy, of building and creating, and a cycle of burning it all down again, and so on and so on. So I think that what the tower does is show a wider, a broader, a less embittered, a less fearful approach to um, to existence and to the cycles of history. Uh, And so I think it's fascinating to read both in tandem because it shows just how uh, multifaceted a human imagination can be, how we can understand different things at the same time. And I think that's true of Yeats, but it's also it's also true more generally. It shows this capacity uh, to both understand and fear and fight in the realm of real uh, day to day politics but also to see these things in a larger context as well. So in fact, I'd love to kind of ask you about that because that's a fabulous sort of deep dive into one particular poet. But in the book, you show that actually um, in the sort of time period of a lot of change, particularly in the 1920s, he's not the only one um, who's looking, who's using poetry, but looking at kind of Irish history and sort of myths as well um, to make sort of political arguments about changes that are happening right then and there, right? You talked about kind of um, the essential banning of divorce. Um, So could you maybe briefly introduce us to a few of the other poets or um, aspects of poetry where we see this kind of looking at the actual moment, but bringing in wider history and context as well through poetry? Absolutely. Uh, Yes, you're absolutely right to say that Yeats wasn't the only one. And I suppose the example that uh, most comes to mind is that of his younger peer um, and uh, contemporary, the poet Austin Clarke. Just to give you a little background about Clarke, who's perhaps less well known, um, Clarke was... Uh, I suppose born in the 1890s, he he sort of found his voice as a poet in the in the revolutionary years, 1916 to 1921. He was tremendously um, uh, prolific and tremendously engaged with the development of the Irish state in the 1920s. And this uh, engagement, I think, is shown in it's an early work of his, but I think it's actually his best, his collection uh, Pilgrimage, which came out in 1929, and is in many ways. Um, an exploration, I guess, of the Irish distant past. Uh, he was in particular interested in what he called 
the period of the Celtic Romanesque. So we're talking the period, I guess, before the Norman invasion. So going back to maybe the 10th, 11th centuries, uh, the period of the uh, great Irish scholarship and monasticism of the uh, uh, creation of uh, religious texts and uh, the foundation of the great monasteries. This was the period that enraptured um, uh, the imagination of Austin Clarke. And yet he's looking at this period in the light of the early years of Irish self-governance. Now, supposedly, the Irish state propagated uh, this period. Definitely, the, if you read the political speeches for this, uh, from this time, there's an ambition to propagate, I guess, for the state to embody the values of this Celtic golden age. And so you'd think that uh, Clark and, uh, I guess, the, the tendencies of Irish law would be on the same page but not a bit of it. Now, Clark, as one of his biographers, Morris Harmon said, used the past as a drawbridge in order to mount the most daring raids upon the present. So Clark, as well as being a poet, was a scholar. And he understood that the way that the Irish state was currently moving was very much out of kilter with a lot of its historical traditions. I'll give you an example of divorce, as you mentioned it. Now, um, the Irish state made moves to make divorce more difficult and eventually ban it in the 1920s and the 1930s. And yet, if you look at the uh, mode of Irish law, which was prevalent before the Norman invasion in the 13th century called Brehon law, uh, so this is Gaelic Celtic law, essentially. In Brehon law, divorce was allowed among a wide, uh, for a wide variety of reasons, including, uh, and women could initiate it for, in particular, if they were misused by their spouses in any ways, if their spouses weren't sort of keeping up with their end of uh, the various bargains uh, made, made in marriage, uh, then, yeah, divorce was, uh, was certainly legally possible. So Clark looked back on this period and then saw it in relation to what he called, uh, I think, the uh, puritanical new breed of Gales and, and the laws of the 1920s and 1930s, and essentially contrasted them in pilgrimage. So if you look at, uh, the, at, at the poems in this collection, in a language which is kind of dazzling and sparkling, it's, um, it's, it's, I can only encourage people to read it because I don't think he's, he's read as much as, uh, as, as, uh, as his peers are, are now. But he created this image of a medieval Ireland, which was essentially less repressed, less puritanical, more open in kind of spirit and intellect in the 1920s. And he did so through the images of the Gaelic past. And what I find so interesting is whereas the Irish state was also saying that it was defending and protecting a specific Gaelic version of the past, Clark was saying the Gaelic past was entirely different and entirely at odds with current laws. I suppose another example would be the censorship regime. Now, Ireland uh, had the, uh, eventually, uh, following the 1929 Censorship Act, had the most uh, strict censorship regime, certainly of any English-speaking country, perhaps of any democracy uh, in the world. And uh, of course, this was counter to everything that Clark thought. And so he he compared, I suppose, the kind of intellectual freedom of the, uh, as he saw it, of the Irish Middle Ages to, as I say, the uh, the kind of repressive domestic laws which exiled so many of Ireland's great writers. Beckett ended up living abroad. Uh, James Joyce lived abroad. Uh, people like later on, Edna O'Brien had her works uh, banned. Uh, really people who we see now as uh, some of the greatest writers of the Irish 20th century either found it impossible to live or publish in Ireland because of the repressive and authoritarian nature of the Irish church and Irish society. And uh, one of the reasons I admire Clark is that I see him as, um, I guess, uh, as, as presenting an alternative past and therefore an alternative future. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I think that was one of the most kind of powerful examples of uh, someone using all of the capacity of their brain, right? You talked sort of about the facets of imagination earlier. Um, and Clark, in a lot of ways, to me, kind of was like, wow, he's he has this historical knowledge and this understanding of kind of the implications of current politics and what's happening right now, but then can also, you know, marry it in a way with um, all of this understanding of how to use language and stories. Um, 
And I think I, I do agree. I'm kind of like, oh, I want to go read more of his poetry now. <laughs> Wait, I'm delighted. No, there's, uh, I mean, I do think Clark is having a moment. Uh, there's a great uh, biographer of his, Kit Fryer, whose work I was able to draw on a lot. That book came out in the last couple of years. Also, I've noticed that when there are contemporary legal scandals or legal issues in Ireland, people have been quoting Clark. And now uh, recently um, uh, there have been uh, scandals over church mistreatment of women who are essentially uh, imprisoned in church-run homes, the laundries they were called in the 20th century. Uh, Clark, uh, uh, it, these were one of the many aspects of, uh, of contemporary Ireland that Clark found abhorrent. And I've noticed that works of his, like the Redemptorist, for example, are being quoted by people who, um, you know, who, who are uh, protesting more recently justice is in Ireland so it's I think really interesting there yeah he's he you know sometimes I think that sometimes writers have their moment when times need them and I do think that Clark is one of these necessary poets I expect to hear more from him in, uh, in the coming years well so I want to ask about another one um because in the book Thomas Kinsella um is another really interesting kind of dual career type poet um in the one hand he's a poet but he also is a civil servant um, so not even a politician in terms of kind of getting elected and having a particular campaign, like literally is the state in a lot of ways. Um, and you talk about in the book how he's, quote, haunted by the symbols and images of the state in his poetry and very much shows kind of the intertwining of being the state apparatus and being sort of an independent person kind of in one person at the same time, which is really interesting. But I kind of wanted to um, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to really go into like everything he did, uh, which is sad. And I would definitely ask listeners to read the book for that part because it is fascinating. Um, but I wanted to ask about one kind of particular episode in his career um, and what it shows us about the intertwining of poetry and law. And I was really struck by this. So essentially, as I understand it, there was a really one of those big impactful government reports that comes out every so often that people actually learn the name of in the press for a while um and he wrote an incredible poem in response to it in a way and then there was an anonymous response to his poem and so it ends up being this like multifaceted layer of law and poetry and press and debate and very much as we've just been speaking about thomas clark kind of a poet being used in a particular moment or contributing to a particular moment um kinsella seems to really in this example. So I'm wondering if you could kind of tell us a little bit about sort of what was that debate and contest and the role of poetry and law there? Yeah, well, okay. So what I think you're referring to is a section of my book on um, Kinsella's long poem, Butcher's Dozen. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on this. So essentially, um, Butcher's Dozen was written in response to a massacre on the 30th of January 1972 uh, in uh, Derry, in Northern Ireland. Uh, British soldiers shot 26 unarmed civilians during a protest march in the Bogside area. And so, uh, of course, the shockwaves from this uh, went around the world. Um, it was... Um, it created, I mean, it destabilized the Irish state in some ways. It led to a huge wave of sympathy for Republican militants. It led to the British embassy in Dublin being burned down. It did look for a moment as if uh, the, the Irish state itself was teetering. Um, and connected to that, I guess, was that it tapped in to some ve a very long lineage uh, idea of injustice on the island of Ireland. Uh, many of the victims were shot while fleeing the soldiers. Uh, some were shot trying to help the wounded and so on. So it was a, um, a a scandalous event. And obviously there was a legal inquiry into it set up by the British state, the Widgery Report, uh, led by a, a judge of that name. Now, this was widely seen as a whitewash. It exonerated the soldiers. It put the blame on the marchers. Um, and so Kinsella actually wrote, and so Kinsella actually wrote his poem, Butcher's Dozen, not in response to the killings, but as he said, in response to the legal report. It's actually a palimpsestic text. It overwrites the legal report itself. And so as Kinsella said, the poem was written in response to the report of the Widgery Tribunal. Uh, in Lord Widgery's Cold Putting Side of the Truth, the nth in the historic series of expedient falsehoods, and there you see this sort of long lineage thing, with prejudice literally wigged out as justice, and so on and so on. So that was uh, Butcher's uh, 
uh, Butchers, doesn't he? He wrote it very quickly, uh, I think within eight days or so of the um, uh, Widger Report being issued, and he published it as a pamphlet. And so I think it captured the public, uh, you know, or, or a widespread public mood in Ireland of a revulsion and injustice. Um, but it also, of course, um, had sort of uh, it. Uh, what I was interested in about that poem is how it, it he tapped into Irish poetic traditions. So what essentially the poem involves is various ghosts rising up of the people who were killed that day and kind of uh, speaking, you know, ironically or sardonically about, you know, how, oh, we really were guilty. But uh, yeah, so it's great that Widry identified this. You know, it, it rings with a kind of caustic irony all the way through. Um. But in doing that, there's actually an 18th century poem in the Irish language called The Midnight Court, which itself has this kind of anarchic, sardonic, subversive court uh, court process as its base. Uh, it was by an 18th, uh, by a sort of late 18th century, early 19th century uh, Irish language poet called Brian Merriman uh, and Kurt Mayen Iha, or The Midnight Court, it was called. And so he's clearly drawing on this. That And I thought that was fascinating that there are kind of indigenous traditions of poetry with which to respond, I guess, to uh, contemporary events in the legal world. There's a kind of lineage there. So from the Midnight Court to uh, Kinsella's Butcher's Dozen. And then, as you say, there was an extra and really weird coda, I have to say. And this is one of the surprising things I discovered, that there was a poem published by the British and Irish Communist Organization called Kinsella's Oversight, which came the year after. And all they do, they reprint Kinsella's poem, but instead of words which show outrage against the British army, as his poem often does, it turns this outrage towards the Irish Republican army. Because, of course, in it, there's another reading of Bloody Sunday, which was that had the IRA not been present as, as a threat, I guess the most sympathetic reading you can give of events that day to the British army would be that, you know, made sort of uh, paranoid and afraid by the existence of the IRA, they were going to, uh, you know, they, they were going to be uh, maybe trigger happy. And so what the Kinsler's oversight does is turn the outrage of the poem towards uh, the IRA. So where, where Kinsler might mention a British army officer, the Kinsler's oversight, this anonymous pamphlet, mentions an IRA leader, and so on and so on. It just goes all the way down through it. And it's the weirdest palimpsestic intervention I have ever seen, and I can't fully explain it. It doesn't look quite organic. I do wonder if there was kind of some kind of, uh, 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 you know, sort of secret hand at work here. It's odd that it's anonymous. It's odd that it kind of so readily plays into a necessary propaganda uh, lit narrative for the British government. And so anyway, the, he, there's no way of there's no way of knowing now. But what I would say is that whoever created it, whether it was the British uh, and Irish communist organization or some hidden hand, it shows an acknowledgement of the power of poetry in Ireland, that this ballad existed and therefore needed a counter ballad in order to, uh, to, to conflict with it. And so I think it's just a fascinating example, you know, uh, the existence of Butcher's Dozen and that overwriting Kinsella's oversight. They both show both the role of poetry in close connection running alongside legal reports and also the power and necessity of poetry in this sphere. I'm glad I wasn't the only one surprised then um, to hear that because certainly reading it, I was sort of like, okay, massacre, government report. All right, I'm with you now. That that makes a lot of sense. Okay, interesting. Poetical ballad response. Okay, creative. But then the, the idea of the palimpsest and the idea of the response was like, whoa, okay, this is a whole extra level of engagement, um, yeah. which was really ago. interesting. Yeah, it is. Maybe somebody knows what happened there and who did it. If they do, I'd love them to get in touch with me. Uh, I'd love to know what happened there. Uh, maybe it's, uh, yeah, maybe maybe that story will never be told. But uh, as I guess uh, whatever happened, as an example, as I say, of the intertwining of law and poetry in Ireland, I was, I was delighted to find it. And, and oh, I bet. It. Yeah. Well, and, and what's really fascinating is um, even just obviously doing an abbreviated form of talking about the book now in the interview, we can't go into every aspect. Um, but there's such a strong through line of intertwining between poetry and law and kind of the politics of the day. Um, and you show that that's not something that stops at any point. That's not just a, oh, okay, bloody Sunday, that was the last thing with this 
interchanging of reports. In fact, you show in the book that this continues throughout, for example, the 1980s, when there's quite a lot of popular contesting of law and norms, right? We've talked about kind of um, the laundries and the like heavy Catholicism that starts to get some protests, um, but that poetry was also involved in these debates. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about kind of the role of poetry in this contest and the impact maybe that some of these poems had? Sure. Okay. So looking at the 1980s, I guess my a lot of my book kind of uh, turned the camera back towards the South, I guess, uh, from the North through the 1980s. And what I was interested in there, I guess, were what you might call in short the poetics of embodiment uh, and how both the law and the poetry attempted to represent the body. Because Irish politics in the early 1980s took a profoundly corporeal, a bodily turn, whether that's the bodies of the hunger strikers starving to death in uh, the prisons of Northern Ireland, but the famed example of Bobby Sands and so on, or indeed women's bodies, because of course this was a time when there was a successful a Catholic campaign to insert a new provision in the Irish constitution, copper fastening an existing ban on abortion. And so um, I guess uh, what I was interested in is how poets responded uh, to uh, to these legal changes. Um, just to give you a, a single and I think sort of not- notable example of how uh, poets responded to the presence of religion and the body in Irish public life and Irish law, one marvellous poem is Paula Meehan's The Statue of the Virgin at Granard Speaks. Now, uh, this was written in response to uh, the death of a, uh, a young girl, really, she, uh, a young teenager called Anne Lovett, who uh, gave birth in secret in front of a religious icon, the town of Granard, in the early 1980s, and uh, then the baby died and she died. And it sent shockwaves through Irish society. And her poem, The Statue of the Virgin at Granard Speaks, is from the perspective of the religious icon uh, in, uh, in front of which uh, Anne, Anne Lovett gave birth. And so she uh, writes, uh, and so in, in this poem, uh, The Statue of the Virgin Mary talks about the awfulness and the trauma of what she has witnessed. But of course, in a silent icon coming to life and speaking, you actually have a a kind of imaginative projection of the condition of women in Ireland at the time. Um, Women were, I think, expected to, um, to occupy a private sphere, Uh, The Irish constitution, of course, famously says, and still says to this day, it hasn't been removed uh, disgracefully, uh, that the state recognises that by her life within the home, woman provides to the state a support without which the public good cannot be achieved. Uh, And so there is this expectation of women's ambitions to be limited to, uh, uh, I guess, to childbirth, childcare, the domestic. And of course, uh, this was in a a strongly Catholic framework that that kind of uh, that view of the world, I suppose, you can connect to uh, certain papal encyclicals, which also see, uh, you know, the the division of spheres of there being a male public sphere and a female uh, private sphere as being kind of God's ordained way that uh, humanity should should run its affairs. Um, And of course, you know, the narrowness, the limitation, the lack of imagination, which those views and the harm that those views did became apparent in the death of Anne Lovett, the fact that she was pregnant and couldn't tell anyone, the fact that she, rather than go to a doctor, she went to a religious statue. Um, women's bodies had been uh, central to Irish political discourse in those years because, as I say, the Catholic Church was campaigning for a uh, ban on abortion to be inst- instituted within the Irish constitution. And so just the, uh, you know, sort of, I guess, banishing to the realms of uh, shame and the unspeakable things that are going to happen. People are going to get pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, you know, uh, it, uh, it's, 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 part of, it's part of life. And yet uh, you, att- you see kind of, I guess, the, the church in the Irish state attempting to, um, to, I guess, hive off an element of reality and say this doesn't exist. What I find so interesting about Paula Meehan in her poem, and a wonderful poem about this, it's available online, I'd recommend anyone to read it, The Statue of the Virgin of Granard Speaks, is that she herself was given access and a voice. In 1966, Ireland introduced free secondary education. This is how laws change 
lives. She was from a background where people weren't expected to have any particular social att- educational attainment. Um, certainly her parents would have never thought of university as an option for themselves. What she Meehan was born in 55. Free secondary education came in in 66. She was just about in time for it. And so all of a sudden the world of literature, letters, education were open to her. She didn't have to be the silent, unspeaking religious icon standing there, not having the words for the horrors she saw around her. She could speak. And so I think that when you read her poem, like the Statue of the Virgin at Granard speaks, you can see an outworking of an Irish law there of that tremendous access and possibility that was given when the educational franchise was expanded in 1966. No, Sorry. That, that's that's beautiful. Um, I'm really glad you um, picked that example, I suppose, because I think that is a really important um, combination of a lot of these things, right? One change of law here allows for a protest against another law there. Exactly, um, yeah. And it is really powerful. Um, I you, you include some of the poem um, in the book and the idea of a silent icon speaking, um, you know, really reframes uh, the kind of experience uh, and gives a very different perspective on it, which I think is particularly powerful for issues around um, abortion, pregnancy, etc. Uh, because the arguments, the debates have been going on for such a long time that it often is kind of like, is there anything new to say? <laughs> is everyone just shouting what they already believe? And there's nothing, there's no new way of thinking about this. Um, and I think in some ways, the intervention of her poem is really powerful because it offers a new perspective and a new way of kind of going, oh, hang on a second, like you think that the perspective is this, but actually there's another way of looking at it. Absolutely. And in sort of what what poetry does, you know, refreshing language, making us look at language anew, it can make us think anew as well. And um, I think that the publication of that poem in The Man Marked by Winter, her 1991 collection, represents, you know, one of the the great um, landmarks, I guess, of Irish 20th century poetry. So, In fact, then, I kind of want to move um, to the 21st century uh, set of Irish poets that you talk about, because you actually talk about a lot of continuity between the ones we've already been talking about in the 21st century. And in fact, you say in the book, quote, the specific Irish inheritance of the idea of the poet as a popular guardian and protester against injustice, which obviously in the poem you've most recently just told us about, quite clearly shows the role of the poet Um, as that sort of guardian and protester, how have some of the 21st century poets kind of carried on that inheritance? Um, I think uh, it's it's, it's one of the things that amazed me when reading more. So I'm talking about poems by my own contemporaries now. So people who were born at roughly the same time as I was, grew up breathing roughly the same atmosphere as I did. Um, And what's so interesting about their poetry is, as you point out, how they draw on the works of their predecessor, uh, their predecessors. And I think that actually this issue of embodiment, which I talked to you a little bit about in relation to 1980s poetry, is really an element of contemporary poetry. Now, it's harder to talk about contemporary poetry because, you know, you, you, I haven't had the time with it, the perspective on it. It's, and so this is going to be a lot more kind of partial and speculative than what I've, I've said before. But still, um, I think that in 1982, Avan Boland, who was uh, one of these earlier 1980s poets who I, I write about, changed the course of Irish poetry forever by publishing a volume called Night Feed. This idea that you might have a body and feed a baby from it and so on would have been, I think, scandalous and unwritable in Irish poetry. If you consider it in the early 80s when she published that book, well over 90% of books published in Ireland were by men. Uh, and so that... Uh, that acknowledgement of embodiedness and corporeality. And uh, it, it's just something that was attemptedly pushed to the margins of Irish public discourse. And to title a book, Night Feed, I actually think it doesn't seem like much, but I actually think it represents a major uh, uh, a turning point, I guess, in Irish literature. So fast forward a few decades, um, this sort of poetry of embodiment, I think, is uh, tremendously evident in a really great contemporary poet, uh, Durin Negriefa, who uh, 
it's published she published mainly in irish until 2015 she started uh, publishing in english and she's brought out two wonderful collections clasp in 2015 and then uh to star the dark more recently and um this issue of i guess um uh you know birth and its complications and uh, the moral and ethical issues that surround it and childbearing child rearing and so on this is all kind of central to her work and i do wonder whether van boland helped to open that door to um not only say that these things are speakable but actually that they're important that they constitute in the widest possible sense politics and uh, that they are ne- uh, a necessary element of, of public discourse. And of course, you can see Negriefa's work alongside, I think, the long campaign uh, for full bodily autonomy for, uh, for, for women in Ireland. Um, the, it was called, just to sort of bring people up to speed who aren't fully aware of this, it was called the Repeal of the Eighth Movement, the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution in 1983. Um, uh, um, placed a constitutional ban on abortion. This was repealed by popular vote in 2018. And there was a series of sort of uh, legislative landmarks along the way. In particular, one terrible case of a woman whose life might have been saved uh, by uh, by an abortion who died of a septic miscarriage, the case of Savita Halepanavar, um, was uh, something that I know influenced Negria for in her poetry because she writes one of her poems, uh, Waking, uh, for Savita Halepanavar. And it's about uh, the issue of miscarriage and birth and so on. And I think that um, this sort of claiming of one's space, of one's life, of one's voice, and its importance and significance, uh, this refusal to be uh, silenced or overlooked or told this is a woman's issue and therefore not important and therefore not an issue for poetry. It's, you know, th- this is the barrier against which Negriefa is, is pushing and fighting. And you can see, I think, you know, in the insistence of the significance of her own life and experiences in her work, you can see a parallel in the legal protests that were happening at the time. Now, from Oh, gosh. I mean, all the way through the period where the Eighth Amendment was enforced, there were protest marches. These things got huge by 2018. They stretched through kilometres, uh, for kilometres through uh, Ireland and, uh, and and through Dublin City in particular. I remember one protest uh, where I was just struck by the number of signs which involved a rejection of ideas that had been projected. So, you know, the signs said things like, I am more than a womb, um, you know, I am, get your uh, rosaries off our ovaries. It was a kind of taking of that narrative of the female place, you know, the one embodied in the Irish constitution that said the place of the woman is in the home. And it was a rejection of it. It represented a profound spiritual transformation, intellectual transformation in how Irish women were willing to see themselves, see their own lives, see their place in the world, um, see how they would speak in public and 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 physically occupy space that act of taking over the city center for a protest it would have been unimaginable you know for a previous generation to have done that it was imaginable now and i just think that that energy and confidence and that uh that willingness to stake a claim on one's own life and speak about it is there in the poetry of negria uh and so yeah i'd really recommend uh, people who are interested in the contemporary women's rights movement in ireland to look at that collection clasp, I think, uh, yeah, its whole tonality rings loud with wider legal and political dissensions. Mm. No, thank you for um, introducing that, I think, probably to a lot of our listeners. Um, And really, it is a fabulous example of the continuation um, of this kind of role of the poet in um, Ireland, which is wonderful. Um, And so to kind of finish off, in a way, our tour of the book, I'd love to, you know, we started off with one of the most famous poets. Um, You then introduced us very helpfully to perhaps lesser known poets and made really convincing arguments for why we should all go off and read them. Um, And so I sort of want to end with the other or one of the other incredibly famous um, poets, obviously Seamus Heaney. And you talk about him in the book and similarly to a number of the other poets we've discussed, um, something that clearly comes out that's absolutely fascinating is his own knowledge of Irish legal history. And in fact, like some of the others we've spoken about, he's, in addition to being a poet and, you know, creative and imaginative that comes with that, there's a lot of knowledge there. Um, 
So can you tell us a bit about kind of how we can see his sort of reading and interpretation and understanding of Irish legal history in his poetry? Yeah, um, I guess Heaney understood that legal history in Ireland has two very different facets. There is, of course, the, you know, the list of legislation. You can go to the Irish Parliament and you can make a lineage of laws, or you can go to, indeed, the uh, Assembly at Stormont to make a lineage of their laws and so on, and then go back uh, to the uh, former, the, the I guess, the crown-sponsored dispensation, which made laws uh, for Ireland going back centuries. But then, of course, there is what Heaney called unwritten law. And this was always the more interesting and significant element of Irish law to Heaney. He has a poem from the 1980s, a kind of fantastical poem called From the Republic of Conscience, where in his dream republic, the politicians would swear to uphold unwritten law. So what is unwritten law? It's actually law, I think, that recognizes rights that are antecedent to um, official law that actually override the prescriptions of centralized and official law that official law actually cannot interfere with. So you can see that, I guess, most visibly, as I say, in a poem which celebrates unwritten law, like uh, from the Republic of Conscience, but you can also see it in a play written in the early 2000s uh, called The Burial at Thebes. Now, The Burial at Thebes was a version of the play Antigone. I'll just set out the uh, kind of underlying uh, themes of Antigone for people who aren't familiar with it. So Antigone was a work by uh, the Greek uh, playwright Sophocles. Uh, It is a a work which sets the power of the family against that of the state. And you get the sense that in the city-states of ancient Greece, where Sophocles was writing, they were working these things out for the first time. What loyalties do you owe to the state and to its laws? What loyalties do you owe to things outside that? And what do you do when these two things clash with each other, when it's not possible for you to abide by the law and abide the official law and abide by other laws? So the story of Antigone, is that in very short, is that the king has banned the, um, uh, the uh, mourning of uh, the brother of Antigone. He is declared an enemy of the state. It said that his corpse will lie in the dust and rot. But Antigone has family loyalty and piety, which means that she must perform the rites of burial and the religious rites uh, over his body in order not to violate a deep and ancestral sense of what she knows is right. And so there's an unwritten law which says that the dead and the dead of your family must be shown respect. And there's a written law which says this man is an outlaw. He is to be left to rot. That shows both, uh, that's the story of Antigone, and that is really the clash of, uh, of uh, Heaney's unwritten law with written law. And indeed, looked at in a wider sense, in a law and literature sense, it's the clash between what's called positive law, that is law set out by the state, and natural law, which is to say a, a law which is ratified by, uh, I guess, the, the shared practices of a community. Now, of course, that rung loud in Heaney's imagination in the 1980s, because, of course, whereas the state called, for example, hunger strikers, somebody like Francis Hughes, they said these are criminals and murderers, and if they choose to starve themselves to death, then that's on them. And then there were the kind of, I guess, the pieties and loyalties of his first community. Francis Hughes was actually from a farm very near to Seamus Heaney's. He knew his family well. Um, Heaney was invited uh, to uh, and went to a wake uh, when uh, when Hughes died. And so that, uh, you know, the way in which the laws of the state and the laws demanded by other ties and bonds were incommensurate was something that weighed heavily on Heaney. I think you can see it there in his uh, poetry and I think that, uh, and, and in his plays. And I think that um, just this loyalty to I guess, the Rep- what he called the Republic of Conscience, to what you thought yourself was right, to your own imaginative bonds and sympathies was was part of, uh, part of what he was writing. Mm. I'm, I'm glad you um, mentioned kind of both some of his poetry as well as uh, his version of Antigone, um, because I think that it does highlight a lot of the things, uh, not only that he was clearly interested in, but also a lot of the themes we've been discussing throughout this interview um, and are really present throughout your book. 
Um, so that does, in a way, sort of hit on a lot of the main points um, in the book. Obviously, as I've said before, um, listeners are encouraged to read the book itself for all of the great details. Um, but as we come to the sort of end of the interview, I'd love to ask you a little bit about um, sort of your process as well. Um, you talked in the beginning about the sort of trajectory and lineage, I suppose, of how you came to write this book, some of what that experience was like. Um, you've already shared one thing that was surprising to you, which was also surprising to me as a reader. But I'm wondering if there was um, kind of given what an amazing research uh, opportunity you had of the PhD and the postdoc and being in the archives and immersing yourself. Um, is there anything else you would be able to willing to share with us um, about something you might have come across uh, in the archive or realized yourself as you're reading it um, that was particularly surprising to you? I think it's quite often helpful for those of us um, in research to just kind of hear a little bit about other people's processes and be reminded that, you know, we come in with a research agenda, but things change when we encounter stuff. Um, so I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of that from your experience. Sure. I mean, when you talk about things that surprised me, the first thing that came to mind was a finding in uh, the Heaney Letters archive. I wrote a little bit for this because it was so surprising to me. I wrote a, a, just up a little piece for uh, for the Irish Times and, and they published that. So that's online. It came out in 2018. But essentially, um, in 1988, Seamus Heaney received a letter from a man called Niall Farrell, whose sister had been shot dead by British security forces in, um, uh, in Gibraltar. Uh, his sister had been uh, part of an IRA squad which were attempting to plant a bomb there. Uh, essentially, uh, a poem had been written in praise of Maraid Farrell, and uh, Niall Farrell asked Seamus Heaney if he would, um, if he would uh, uh, essentially plug this poem, you know, kind of come out and, and encourage people to read it. And Heaney refused to do this. As he said, he uh, was not sympathetic to the actions of the provisional IRA. But he also, I think, understood the kind of human drama, the pain, the agony, uh, which was, uh, you know, felt uh, in communities which had which had lost people, and including Mairead Farrell's family. And so he wrote back, I thought, quite a sympathetic letter saying, I'm not going to plug this, but if you do want to publish this poem, here are some things you might uh, you might consider. And I write about this in the book. So I was surprised by that because I think uh, Heaney is seen as walking a very fine line uh, between, uh, I guess, uh, calls that he, he, you know, take one political stance or another. And it was very interesting to see how these fine-grained decisions were made in the historical moment, you know, faced with a request from somebody, but also faced with his own conscience, which was, you know, not, not, not in keeping with the request and so on. So anyway, I wrote about, but what was interesting about this was that I, on his draft letter in return to Niall Farrell, he actually wrote a few lines from a poem, which I recognised. It's about, I guess the poem is about, uh, what is it, just a cormorant, this sort of murderous death-dealing bird sitting in the sun, seemingly waiting for something. And I realised it was like an image of Gibraltar. It was like an image of the SAS there uh, waiting to, uh, you know, that, that sort of kill squad, which nobody made that connection for. I thought, that's fascinating. So I have to write about this. And um, so anyway, Heaney published this uh, this poem, uh, never gave, a, never in his lifetime gave a breath of an indication of what it originated from. But there on the letters draft, I could see part of its origin. Now, there's an, as I discovered afterwards, there's another origin moment in this in, for this poem as well, because a friend sent me a photo of the same poem that I'm telling you about there on the wall of this rather beautiful house on the Irish coast, um, uh, a place called Boharbui. And Heaney had written out the poem for the owners and had titled it Boharbui. And there's a way in which you can see this vision of a whitewashed house and a bird sitting near it as being that of a beautiful sunny day on the Irish countryside. And clearly Heaney wanted it to be seen this way, titling it Boharbui and giving it to the owners of this house uh, and letting it be uh, be shown on its wall there. But there's also, of course, a secret murderous history whereby the whitewash isn't the whitewash on this cottage. It's the whitewash of a legal inquest into the Gibraltar um, uh, killings, which said, which which found that the killings of uh, of uh, the the bombers was uh, was lawful. So there were two elements there. Uh, you know, both Heaney's sense of his own uh, kind of uh, you know uh, status as as a sort of friend and somebody celebrating somewhere and something beautiful. His own stay in this house, 
And yet there was also a sort of uh, hidden and a rather agonized uh, history, which connects into legal history, which is why it was relevant for my book beneath it too. So yeah, I just found the, 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 the tangled origins of that poem came as a surprise. And yeah, I was delighted to have an arena to write about it. What, what, a, what a fine line to be walking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank, yeah. thank you for sharing that. Um, Cause I think that's, that's absolutely fascinating in a lot of ways encapsulates kind of the book in a really nice way. Um, so that brings me on to my next question, which, and my last question, in fact, which is mildly unfair, because as I said, um, I did get an advanced review copy of this book, which suggests that it really has only just come out. And yet, what are you working on now or next? Oh, yeah, it never stops, does it? So no, <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's always there's always something. And so in this case, I'm actually interested in uh uh, Heaney, again, I just think there's such richness there and archival richness too. You know, there's 52 boxes of letters in Atlanta. There's countless boxes of literary materials in Dublin. He was tremendously generous with his source materials and it will be the work of generations to uh, do justice to uh, to this newly o- opened archival material. Now, one of the things that came out of an early dive into his archives was his engagement with the world of visual art and painting. So many of his friends were painters, uh, they were sculptors, uh, he was writing things about their work, they were sometimes sharing ideas which you can see made their way into his poems. And so when I first read through the Heaney archives, I was looking for things in on law and literature. And I was kind of irritated that I kept on coming across things on painting. I was like, I don't need, need this. And eventually I thought, wait a second, this is a whole, this is, this is, this is a whole different thing. And so I've just started looking into that. And so I'm I'm so interested in what people in 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 how artworks can affect people in standing in front of a painting, and how maybe you can see things about yourself that you weren't able to see before by engaging through this painting of how the artwork is a site of exchange, of how you read into it, but also you're reading out from it, of how it's possible maybe to contact states of thought and emotions about the real world, about people's own lives, I think in Heaney's case, that he didn't know that he had, that were somehow numbed or blunted or hidden, but that he could, how is it that you can feel something more strongly in front of a work of art than you can in front of your own life? What is it that art accesses and taps into? These are, of course, relevant questions when you're reading poetry, but they're also relevant about uh, painting. And and so I think by writing about painting, hopefully I will be able to just carry on this sort of lifelong investigation into what poetry is, what poetry does. I've just started on it. I've just started asking myself some questions about it. Uh, there's not going to be any sort of major insights or publications for a good while yet, but uh, I'm I'm interested in it all the same. Well, while you dive back into those archives that sound absolutely fascinating, um, listeners can read the book that we've been primarily discussing, um, which, as a reminder, is titled Poetry, Politics and the Law in Modern Ireland, published by Syracuse University Press in 2022. Dr. Adam Hanna, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks so much.